It's uh, great to be in front of you here today. We've been three days at this conference on problem-based learning, police training officer, and new methods of training and development in our profession. It's been exciting to me to meet you. Uh, I consider the people who self-select themselves to come to this kind of a, a conference on progressive police reform to be the vanguard of what's happening in our, in our profession. So in many ways, this, is, this talk is going to be preaching to the choir. But I'm doing it because I think we share some of these ideas, and I want to get the message out there that what you're doing matters, and what you're doing is important to the, to the field. Today I want to talk to you about three things, and only three things. I want to talk to you about a woman I met a number of years ago who lives in a community in New Orleans called Hollygrove. And she's a senior there. And the work I did was through our, our company that does urban development and community development and uh, crime prevention. And uh, we developed a program called Safe Growth. And it was about helping communities turn back from the brink of crime. And this organization was AARP, which works with uh, 50, uh, 50 plus uh, population trying to help them. And Miss Ruthie is a resident in this community called Hollygrove. And she's a really cool person as a senior and as a resident and as a citizen of our, of our, of our country. So I want to talk to you about Miss Ruthie. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to do, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to talk to you about the reality of policing and law enforcement today. I want to talk to you about what we actually do every single day. And, and thirdly, I want to talk to you a bit about um, how Miss Ruthie plays into what we can do in the future and what we need to do as a profession to, to become successful. So that's the three themes I want to talk to you about. So let's start at the beginning. Talk about where we are today, what we're doing, and what the reality is, what the image is. A couple of weeks ago, I was walking through a magazine, uh, through a store into the magazine area, and I picked up a magazine. It was just a magazine on public affairs and city development, and it had a section on policing in there. And I, f I figured through the, the document, it was maybe a 100-page magazine about different types of policing type issues, and I came across pages, page after page after page, and they looked sort of the same. They looked like this. They looked like a, uh, an advertisement for a tactical policing conference. The next page had a, 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 a description of a police expo which had a lot of uh, armored personnel carriers, new weapon systems, new defenses, uh, night goggles, and all the kinds of things that, that we hear about in, in, in training but show up on these magazines with increasing regularity. The next page was this discussion here on the National Homeland Security Conference, which is a, uh, a large or, uh, event to talk about uh, anti-terrorism and things we need to do to deal with terrible incidents like we had just recently in Orlando and the, t the horror that that causes and the impact it causes in our communities. The next page was another uh, 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 conference advertisement about this, in this case, a tactical conference, about the tactics of policing and so forth, and, and, and on and on it went. It was a little disturbing to me. Not because I'm against tactics or against the warrior, so-called warrior ways, because I think that's always been a part of police work. It's always been a part of of the job. When I was a police officer, we certainly had SWAT officers. We had that element to our job. We changed from revolvers over to different kinds of weapons. So the tactics of policing have changed. I want to ask you though, has our training kept up? Have, has the training that we, we, do, we did in the 1950s and the 1970s, where we were using revolvers, when the revolver shifted over to a new kind of weapon, did our training accompany that? That's a question I think we need to start asking. So I thought about this, and I thought, well, what's the reality of our job? So I put this number up there, and I want you to have a look at the number on the screen. And the number is 694. And I want to ask you, what do you think that number represents? What do you think? Number of ice cream vendors who currently work through the summer months of our city? The number of times that police officers uh, typically run into confrontations in the course of a year? That number isn't picked at random. The number was the product of a little research project I did about two weeks ago, looking at police incidents, crime incidents, violent incidents, and particularly the kinds of things that happened recently in Orlando, which was essentially a mass murder. And I thought to myself, well, how often do these mass murders happen, really? Are they getting worse? 
what, what is happening with the kinds of weapons that are being used? Is this a, an attack on the country by terrorists? What does it actually look like? And what I discovered was the terrorism-related murders that have happened in this country in the last two years totals to 694. Now, the numbers may be a little fuzzy because it's sometimes difficult to define what we mean by terrorism. So it may be a little more, maybe a little less. But generally speaking, that's generally what we're talking about here. 694 people have been killed in this country by, through the acts of terrorism over the last two years, when the data was available most recently till, till the spring of this year in 2016. Well, what does that mean? What's the reality of that? Well, the reality of that is a terrible thing. The newspapers pick it and splash it in front of the headlines, as they should. But what's the daily experience of every everyday average police officer in the country? Well, how many murders have there been over the past two and a half years? The tally that I came up with using the FBI statistics was 28,000. And what's the reality of those events? The events that the everyday police officer, the homicide investigator, the criminal investigators, what, what is the experience that they run into? Is it like what we're seeing in Orlando? Is it the Al-Qaeda plots and the sleeper cells and the homegrown terrorists? What does that look like? What it actually looks like is domestic violence is the bulk of those murders, which has been the case since I was a cop and since I've been a criminologist and involved in planning and development. That's always been the case. Gangs and drugs. That has, hasn't really changed. So the question we want to say is 2.4 of all the actual murders that occur through the span of two years in this particular case are the reality of what you're seeing splashed across the headlines. But the truth of the matter is 97% is what we're actually dealing with in everyday life. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we want to do in terms of dealing with situations of, of our job for real? The warrior strategies often come out of this belief that we have, we're, being, we're being flooded with terrorists at the gates. Well, there are terrorists at the gates, all right. And they exist inside the home of the every, 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 everyday average family who suffers from dysfunction and drugs and alcohol. That's the terrorism. That's always been the terrorism. And it's the same thing for robbery, and it's the same thing for shootings, and it's the same thing for burglaries, and it's the same thing for everyday life. That's the reality of our job. And I think that's what we need to start thinking about. That if that's the reality, that's what we have to devise our training to focus on. That's what we have to devise our delivery service strategies to, to, to become much better at. And so when we're looking at things like the curriculum in the academy, we have to look at how much time is spent on the tactical skills and how much time is spent on the interpersonal conflict resolution skills. If it's not at least 50-50, then we're in real trouble. So what does that mean for you? I wanna, so that's the second thing I want to talk to you about. What do we do and what works? Over the last 25 years, there's been a major reform in our profession not to do with warrior ways and not to do with tactics, to do with something not related to that at all. And we know about the warrior stuff. We know about the APC showing at the door. We know about all that. But do we really know about the biggest major reform in our profession in the last two and a half decades that has made a major impact on crime and safety? I'm, and I mean major, major crime reductions and so forth. And I'm referring to a strategy that came out of the 70s and 80s called Problem Oriented Policing, or POP. And POP has been around for a, for a long time, and it has had tremendous impacts. And as a result of the POP reforms, there's been books, and there's been hand guide books and, 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 and guidelines on how to tackle certain kinds of crimes. There's been training programs, there's been conferences, and on and on and on. I've been part of this Problem Oriented Policing movement for a long time. As a matter of fact, the reason you're here today to talk about problem-based learning and police training officer and all the kinds of police training reforms is because a number of folks that I work with in the, PTO, in the POP movement got together and said, we need to create a training program that aligns with the problem order police strategy. That's why you're here today. And the fellow who created POP wrote about it is a fellow by the name of Herman Goldstein, a retired professor out of the University of Madison, or University of Wisconsin in Madison. And it, was struck, it struck me last year when we had our conference in Madison, and I said to the audience, and Herman Goldstein lives there, and he was in the audience. And I said, how many of you in the audience here can talk a bit about problem oriented policing, or POP? And it was stunning. After three decades of this, only about three hands went up. That's a shock. It's a shock because 
All the resources at our disposal are right in front of us. One of the guidebooks, robbery of taxi drivers, how to solve that, how to deal with that, how communities have tackled with that, pedestrian injuries and fatalities, how to deal with that. These are guidebooks that are developed by other officers around the country tackling difficult issues, the 97%. Sexual assault by women and strangers, how to deal with that, home invasion robberies. How many in this room have seen 70 guidelines just like this. How many have read these? How many have seen these? How many? We see a show of hands. Yeah, that's what I had last year. Malcolm Sparrow is an academic at Harvard who was a former police, police officer. He wrote this book a couple of months ago called Handcuffed, What Holds Policing Back? The Two Keys to Reform. One of the chapters in Malcolm uh, Sparrow's book is, is the decline of problem order policing and community policing. In other words, boom, <laughs> pops out. We have to do better. So how does Miss Ruthie come into it? Miss Ruthie is a senior from the neighborhood of Hollygrove. She's lived there for her whole life. Since the Katrina storms in 05, the gangs moved back, and the 3,000 residents were besieged by decades of crime, what had been going on for decades. Miss Ruthie and the organization called ARP got together and decided to try to make that community more livable. The police weren't helping in that particular case. City Council wasn't helping in that particular case. We were asked to go and work with the residents, develop this program called Safe Growth, which is not a police-based program, by the way. It's a community-based neighborhood development program. Started with crime prevention using environmental design and morphed into the next generation, which we now call Safe Growth. Over the period of a couple of months, we helped work with the residents, work with the local community, work with the local architects, work with the social workers, and work with some of the local beat officers, developing strategies to tackle problems in Hollygrove. I'm talking about a community of 3,000 residents with, with 25, 26, 27 homicides every year. 3,000 residents. That's a homicide rate that's far in excess of anywhere else in the world. These residents are suffering the consequences. Miss Ruthie, an African-American community in which Miss Ruthie has lived her whole life, are suffering the consequences of that terrorism. That's real terrorism. And so we got together and we started to develop programs. And Miss Ruthie was fascinating. Miss Ruthie started with a program that we never thought would work. And, she, and it, was a, it was a get back to the street and walk for health. Have seniors walk the streets for health. That's how it started. And so Miss Ruthie and some of the seniors started walking. Now keep in mind that the gang drug dealers on the corner are relatives, many are relatives, of people they know. This is their neighborhood and they're saying to them, this is our neighborhood, we're taking it back. And Miss Ruthie called the program Soul Steppers, which is a very cool name. And they started walking. And within a few weeks, the Soul Stepper programs went from 10, 20, 30 residents to 100 residents. And all of a sudden, the residents are coming out and they're engaging. And we started doing things like getting new lights, trimming the hedges, doing some crime prevention designs, taking care of the abandoned buildings. And by the way, the police involvement in these first, first year or so was almost zero. We did this, they did this on their own. They, they actually got together and worked as a team. They organized themselves and we, through being trained and through the programming that ARP and our, our team helped them to, to do. And this made a ma massive difference. And it started a, a momentum, a momentum of change. And within about a year, we started to get organizations coming who wanted to build parks for the children and rebuild the senior center and putting in new lights and establishing areas of the community where people could congregate and work, like a garden center and a community garden, where they started to sell the produce for resources to a poor community. I love the part where the local politicians all made comments about how they were going to change things in the, in the neighborhood and the residents watched carefully. And when the election happened and the politicians did, did not make many changes, what the locals did was they took the election signs because they had no street signs. They took the election signs, turned them backwards, and they wrote the names of the streets and they used those as their street signs. So every time you walked down the street, you knew exactly who the sign was because the other side had the election sign with a politician who didn't do anything on this side had the street name. Talk about empowered. Talk about real empowered. And so Miss Ruthie led to, and her organization and her community led to a major change. And eventually, after two years, eventually, we were able to get the police to really take a major role in shutting down some of the drug houses and shutting down some of the the real high crime areas, and we made a major, a bigger impact on the crime. And we went from 25, 26, 27 homicides down to last year we had two. 
Now, two is a terrible thing, don't get me wrong, and the problems are not gone. But Holly Grove is a far much better place today than it was five years ago, even 10 years ago. Tremendous. That's where we need to go in our profession. That's the real terrorism that I think is, is, is so important. And for the sake of people like Miss Ruthie and the citizens of our country, I think that's what we need to dedicate ourselves to. Thank you.